Good afternoon, everybody. What is this? Uh, Thursday? Is it Friday, the 14th of July? That's great. Uh, welcome. This is always, as, I, as I've been advertising all week, this is one of my favorite events during Summer Fish Trap Week. It's our Fish Trap Fellows reading. Um, since 1990, Fish Trap has offered fellowships to new and emerging writers, and uh, I, I oftentimes look at the list and am amazed who some of these people are, how many have gone on to careers in teaching and publishing. It's always just really rewarding. We, as a matter of fact, we have a Fish Trap fellow sitting in the audience who received a fellowship in 1990. That's Robert Stubblefield right there, uh, which is really, really rewarding, plus many others. Um, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the fellowship process. We have scholarships which go, which uh, are need-based, but our fellowships are merit-based. So folks uh, submit an application, a writing sample, um, and then we have passed, this is one of my favorite things, we have passed Fish Trap fellow, Fellows who know the value of a Fish Trap Fellowship and the Summer Fish Trap Experience screen the applications. They don't see their names, they don't see their resumes, they just see the writing samples. And then we get um, a small group of, of finalists in the genres of fiction, nonfiction, and poetry, which then goes to a judge. Every year we choose a judge who we think knows about the Fish Trap Experience too. Um, this past year's judge was Sharma Shields, novelist Sharma Shields, who's one of our favorites. And, um, and, and she went through and has the hard job of picking just three Fish Trap Fellows from all of these uh, uh, lists. Um, so let's, let's get to it. Uh, summer Fish Trap Fellowships cover not only the tuition to Summer Fish Trap, but also lodging and food for the week, as well as a little travel stipend, which I forgot to give you guys, but I will. Uh, <laughs> um, our fellows this year are Lillian uh, Emmerich Valentine, Francesca Jimenez, and Tochuko Okafor. Uh, we're going to give each of them, each of them are going to read for about 10 minutes. And, uh, and then afterwards, you can have a chance to visit with them if you haven't already. And uh, let's give this a go. First is Lillian. Lillian Emmerich Valentine is a poet, an organic farmer in Western Oregon, but she currently lives in Missoula, Montana, where she's uh, working an MFA candidate recipient of the Hugo Scholarship and instructor of composition. Her work has been nominated for Best New Poets 2023 and has been published or is forthcoming in Ecotone, Salamander, The Fjords Review, and other literary magazines. She spends as much time as possible outside. Yeah. Her favorite bird is a kingfisher. Come on up, Lou. Thank you all for being here. Um, I just want to say it's been such an honor to be a fellow this week alongside the incredibly talented Francesca and Tochoku. And I've experienced so many great conversations around writing in the West that I'm excited to carry with me. Uh, this first poem I'm going to read is called When Writing About the West, and it's about my twin obsessions of grammar and family history. When writing about the West, I begin with horses. Across the plains, wild herds are being removed in the thousands. There is that question of belonging, of how long it takes to be considered part of an ecology. Of course, you could not ask this in the same way about my people, there being, in our case, the violence of choice. My country has a habit of speaking in the past tense. It is a horse that is hard to break. When I say my family came over, say Oregon Trail, I want to anchor it in the preterite, a tense sometimes referred to as simple past. But there is a slipperiness on the rails of language, the past participle barreling on, had come, had arisen, had taken, a sense of continuance that obscures the ending. For years, my family had eaten Thanksgiving dinner beneath the land grant, inheritance framed in gold. Today again, a man without shelter, screaming by the river. I heard a woman say aloud, sometimes the compassion fills up. There, the passive voice was another kind of violence, my silence, a third. There is a way of speaking about nothing I have never mastered the broad emptiness of platitudes, an open field. 
I have ridden a racehorse at full gallop, felt his sweat beneath my legs. Former wild stallion, once started, he could not be stopped. Like many horses out west, his name was Thunder on the mountain. We flew, the field of sky of clouds parting beneath us. When I was ready to be done, I jumped off. There are places in the mountains where the ground echoes underfoot, ancient glaciers rushing on below, like lived history hurtling under the language we use to describe it. My country has a way of speaking without saying anything that in its way says so much. My body has a way of living on this land my ancestors once took. I mean to say, had taken, do take, have been taking, would be. But here I am afraid to bring it to the present continuous, to conjugate the fact that I would be taking. Uh, I'm gonna read. Uh, you don't have to clap after every poem. <laughs> it's okay not to. Um, I'm gonna read a few uh, more raw, less polished poems I've been working on lately. I have a dear friend and classmate who I exchange email poems with a couple days a week. Um, we call them dailies because they're usually revolving around what we're thinking about and, and our work. And in all cases, the first line is the title. I'll read three of those. The judge was raising a lamb, so I made a joke that was lightly biblical, but then my boss said the judge's family had clear-cut the hills near Lolo for a ski resort, so maybe there was something to it. A woman named Tin proposed a cleanse for liver stones, sour cherry juice slurried with olive oil, plus 24 hours of water. The Lolo bald patch troubled her drive to work, forest service land going too far up in the cut. Gifford Pinchot's ghost wife of 20 years flickered out eventually, even in dreams, a burn spot that stayed particularly burnt. In a pinch, a belief is a kind of companion, but the absence of one can be companionable too. I thought the cleanse sounded too easy, wasn't sure I believed in releasing my liver stones like fish. All through the workday, we listed the losses, ash and sawdust sluicing downstream, suburban sprawl, settlements of sediment, but agreed it was just fine to keep giving the judge his local vegetables for lamb chops. After all, he had married in, wasn't a blood relative of the clear cutters, was, we said, one of us. Uh, this one is another email poem, and this one's from the winter, but it connects conveniently with our theme of generations. Even though I know my mother-in-law once was a teenager in Oklahoma, even believe that she owned a pair of ice skates. It's hard to imagine her lacing up on a day the roads froze over and gliding down to a friend's house, all tomboy bravado, her warm cheeks pink and arms pumping. I like how this disrupts my knowledge of her and I notice the way she leans her head as she laughs, saying the ice melted and left her without shoes, a clear way home. So she must have walked back in her socks or that's what I imagine over the place she doesn't remember. The woman I know is not one to call home, ask for a ride, though this may not have been true then in the winter of 73, so I try and reconcile her soaked socks with the careful person she's become. One way blade skating on thin ice sounds like something foolish enough that I might try it, given a cold, flat winter. There is a bright wildness in her pricking at me, something that maybe she could teach me but for now, we are busy uniting over her son. Uh, this is the last of this series that I'll read, and then I have one more poem after this. This one I wrote this week on Wednesday. A man I know rose from the lake, his body coated in a fine silt of freshwater shrimp. Blue-green light late into these nights, the sun illuminating edgeless behind the sky as if into water. The Persephone period is past now, an agricultural term without summer equivalent, that you could name nearly any god for summer and it would be true enough. After the lake, the man threw his clothes in a dark bin, drove back naked with the smell of shrimp riding shotgun, past the road sign where creek had been corrected to crick, and I, as a child, had mocked my mother's Montana accent, worst of all the long vowels of measure that dragged into my vocabulary too, beginning slowly with May like a late start to spring. Post snow, my mother visited me in the tall grass, saying I write much more about my father, and then ghosted me on her way out of town. The Persephone period was just another way of defining the daylight, wrapped up neatly in myth. 
the shrimp a physical tether to belonging. It was the crick that was a bright line on my own drive home. I should say my mother loves me very much. She's just not good at saying goodbye. Um, she's, a, she's a bit of a chronic ghoster. This is the last poem I'll read, and this one is for my great-grandma Lillian, uh, namesake, who's still alive, and she would spend most of her life as a logging camp cook. Preserving the voice boxes of birds. Thinking about the future generations, between my thumb and forefinger, sliding its pink, fleshy voice box into a jar, hoping the box might, with the right technology, replicate its song. Hands thick in its throat, I was dreaming. A future that could reanimate a syrinx, re-green the droughted hillsides, re-bring the bees home. All my dreams had that same prefix, just suggesting they'd been before. That my ancestors had stood in their rich and blooming shadows, had seen the mountains flaming purple with lupine, brought these strange throated blooms to a place by a kitchen window in a little patch of sun. My namesake of three generations told me of bear lard, crusts that flaked beautifully under thumb, the dark mornings she cooked for the loggers, startled porcupine on her way through the stars, the lard stored in a jar in the river, holes poked through its lid. The birds then weren't shrinking, were instead full-throated in the brush as berries, capable of singing two long lingering notes at once, as my ancestors who reapplied themselves to the task at hand, leveling and following the land. Thinking also of a morrow, the boxes they could make, wooden syrinxes that would hold the cross saw's song, the shape of the settled west. They were thinking about a future generation with every tree they felled, father and father of a gleaning, when the pines were swollen with birds, for the future that would be I, my ancestors cut them down. Thank you. Our next reader is Francesca Jimenez. Uh, Francesca is an essayist and fiction writer based in Los Angeles, born and raised in the city's northeastern suburbs of San Gabriel Valley. She is pursuing an MFA in fiction at the University of California Riverside Palm Desert Low Residency Program. Her work explores belonging and rejection through a lens of collective and intergenerational stories. She is also a rock climber hiker, a classically trained violist. I would have loved to hear you play this week. And lover of live music, please welcome Francesca Jimenez. Thank you all for being here. Um, thank you for your presence and attention here this afternoon. I know it's waning on <laughs> later in the week. Um, it's been so special being here, especially uh, since we applied to be fellows, like, I don't know, in November. So it's great to finally be here. Uh, earlier this week, I wasn't sure what I'd be reading today, but after the privilege of being here and having some of the, attending some of the evening readings, uh, meditating on our theme of generations, as being near this river, um, I knew I'd have to read this nonfiction piece of mine called On Learning Tagalog. For those of you who may not know, um, Tagalog is one of the two official languages of the Philippines, and I use air quotes because the other official language is English, but there are over 150 distinct Filipino languages or dialects. On learning Tagalog. My parents don't use Tagalog in conversation with me. I've repeatedly asked. I've tried small greetings, magandang umaga before they start work in the morning, or kumain kana once they break from meetings. Maybe they worry I'll forget my English, that it's foreign to teach their US-born daughter Tagalog. Maybe they think, why does she want to learn now when we've worked so hard for Tagalog not to hinder her American life? But I feel hindered by not knowing, unincluded at family gatherings, at the airport, at Seafood City when the fishmonger asks me something I don't understand. Sorry, I don't know Tagalog, I say. The fishmonger replies, why? My parents didn't teach me. You should learn. I smile and chuckle, as my mom does, from the other side of angle displays of tilapia and salmon and shellfish on ice beds and say, I'm trying to. I can no longer blame my parents for not teaching me Tagalog. I moved back in with them in April 2020, not expecting to stay past October, 
but here I am comfortably and still by my own choice. It's the second time I've lived with them as an adult. The first was when I moved back to Southern California from Washington, D.C. after a relationship I should have avoided, but I needed to make my own mistakes. That ex was from Minnesota, and during one visit, his mom asked me about my parents' accent. In my mind, I was like, what are you talking about? But I don't remember my response. Maybe something about not noticing, since both of my parents have lived in the U.S. longer than they've lived in the Philippines. Maybe something about how they are bosses, how my dad owns a business conducting in-person and online webinars and workshops. And my mom has worked as a general manager at a private club in hospitality and food and wine, and therefore can wine and dine anyone with her sociability and charisma. Maybe I responded by saying they were fluent in English before arriving to the States. My mom often shares an anecdote about failing Filipino in school and getting high marks in English. When she was a student, she learned about Fourth of July and not Filipino Independence Day, which, by the way, is June 12th and commemorates independence from Spain, not from the US. Thanks, imperialism. My parents are assimilated. I might have unconsciously pleaded to my ex's mom and to the whiteness she represented as we had this conversation in her Midwestern suburb. Before I realized that I can no longer my parent blame my parents for not teaching me Tagalog, I asked my mom why. We were more concerned about you learning English, she'd say, which contrasts with the memories of par my parents and aunts and uncles giving me a hard time for not understanding Tagalog at family gatherings while I was growing up. What's so funny, I'd ask. Oh, the joke doesn't really translate, they'd say. Memories of punchlines and chismes going untranslated, of being isolated for only knowing English, memories of learning to love and prepare our dishes, food names being the most Tagalog I knew growing up, an important cultural touchstone, but I craved more. As an adult, whatever that means, getting my own wage-earning job, paying taxes, yet still choosing to live with my parents because the illusion of freedom is too stressful now that I'm comfortable. I've made more of an effort to learn. It's been on my New Year's resolution list multiple times. A family reunion to the Philippines for my Lola's birthday felt like a project deadline. Something to work towards, if only to say in beginner formality, Nagsasalita ka ba ng ingles? Do you speak English? I thought I could get some practice and immersion while still living with my parents. Before, when I tried to practice, they'd, you have such an American accent, my dad would say. Isn't that what you wanted? I could have retorted. But instead I asked, as I had so many times, why didn't you teach me Tagalog? I worry that when my parents retire and age to the point when they need walkers, their English will fade, even though it was my mom's first language and I will no longer understand them. My dad already sips into Bisayan when he's tired. My mom does not know his dialect. Maybe my parents won't understand each other either. There's wonder and fear and disappointment when I speak my little bits of Tagalog, including I don't know, Hindi ko po alam. You should say that when someone speaks to you in Tagalog, my mom would say. But that's not helpful to me or an actual conversation, I'd reply. My mom would smile, nod, and change the conversation. Before lunch and dinner, gutom na ako, and my parents might say, that sounds pretty good. I feel validated. Maybe I want to learn Tagalog to feel more accepted, even though they kept me from learning it. Maybe they see I'm trying now and acknowledge that too. When I learned about Magellan in elementary school, I told my classmates that my dad was from the island where Lapu-Lapu killed him. At least that's what my dad told me. My classmates would say, really? It was more about Lapu-Lapu than my dad. When I learned the extent of Spanish global colonialism for the three Gs, God, gold, and glory, I finally had an answer to the confused questions about my last name. People assumed I was Mexican. I'd say, I'm not, but Spain colonized the Philippines for over 500 years, and conquistadors took Filipinos and used them as slave labor in their colonized lands in the Americas, so that's why my last name is Jimenez. Again, my classmates would say, really? It was more about Spanish colonization than about my last name. These moments from my childhood feel like drops I'm collecting as I live with my parents again, in my childhood home, but as an adult. I've stopped asking my parents why they didn't teach me Tagalog. When I feel anger around it, I write about it or discuss it in therapy, feeding the cognitive dissonance around my understanding and experience of US imperialism, which caused my parents to make decisions I will never have to. Decisions that fill me with guilt and bitterness and a cruel, ironic gratitude. I'm starting to learn some Tagalog on an app called Drops, 
I know enough to know a little, and I know enough Spanish to know what cognates stuck. When I ask my parents to help me practice, it's over meals. They end up talking about the words my mom uses and those that my dad uses, and which words sound as they do in Spanish. Maleta, silla, zapatos, como esta, cibollas, cuchillo. If I'm lucky, they'll share some words with me. Or Kundiman, a popular love ballad like Da Hil Sayo, or a nursery song like Ba Hai Kubo to learn the name of vegetables. I say my parents are sharing these words instead of teaching me because they feel like a gift. Now, I want to be a writer. How rich, looking for all the English words forced on my family from centuries of wartime and occupation. After English, I know more Spanish. Instead of Tagalog, I know the languages of both colonial and imperial forces on my parents' and my grandparents' homeland. It feels fitting that the app I'm learning Tagalog on is called Drops. Drops in a bucket eventually make a downpour, a storm. My brain has already absorbed a lot, but I guess that's why I'm always unpacking. So I can make room to reboot myself in the language of my family. I feel like a child again, an infant talking, learning words without the weight of shame. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Francesca. Francesca mentioned uh, having applied for the fellowship a long time ago. Uh, uh, we do, if you know somebody you may bloom with the summer fish trap experience and you think that they would uh, encourage them to apply for a fish trap fellowship, we open applications usually mid-November and they're open for about a month. The reason we do it so early is so we can go through the screening and judging process before Summer Fish Trap registration opens on February, in early February, so that's why the early application date. We'll put, we'll, we'll, we'll put more out soon. Okay, here's our final, our third Fish Trap fellow. Tochuku Okafor is a storyteller. Yeah, he is, and an electrical engineer, if you didn't know. He's a fiction MFA candidate at Emerson College and holds a master's degree from Carnegie Mellon University. His first academic paper on Latin American literature will be published this summer in the annual print issue of the Latino Book Review. His fiction has appeared in the 2019 Best Small Fictions, the 2018 Best of the Net, and elsewhere. He's at work on a story collection and a novel you can learn more about Tochuku's writing through the Fish Trap website. We, we have, he, Tochuku gave me his, his, his bio and it's, it's a very impressive. I suggest going to take a look. I'm not kidding. It's fun, it's fun to read on the Fish Trap Fellows page. All of your bios are wonderful. Um, please welcome Tochuku. Good afternoon, and thank you for being here. Two days ago, here in the Fish Trap program, the opening page of my novel in progress was workshopped. There was so much brilliant, kind, constructive feedback and engagement with my writing and interpretations so new, I'm reminded again that the story knows more than the storyteller who is telling the story. I'm thankful to my workshop members for this reminder. During the conversation, however, one woman in my workshop said that the name of the main character's mother in my work, Uwadiyoto, is not a normal name. Uwadiyoto is an Igbo name with Nigerian roots. Uwadiyoto translates to, the world is sweet. This woman in my fish trap workshop said the name Uwadiyoto is not a normal name. She said I should replace it with Mama. I raised this microaggressive behavior towards me and my work with our workshop leader and the fish trap directors. Yesterday, our workshop leader sought to create a teachable moment out of this situation. The response of this woman, who insisted on the elimination of a name that she deemed unpronounceable in my novel said she has an African grandbaby. 
I excused myself from the workshop, shivering in tears. While I'm profoundly sad and deeply unsettled by this woman's behavior, I am not here to shame or publicly call her out. I am not at all surprised by her behavior, but my non-surprise does not make this acceptable. What is a normal name? Who gets to define what a normal name is? What if I said white American names are unpronounceable in response? What if this woman did not see me or the character in my novel as different but as similar and equal to her? This woman saw the characters in my novel as exotic, as African, who are in no way similar to her. And so she attempted intentionally or unintentionally, I would never know, to hurt, to erase the people she knows nothing about, to control and to oppress. Because what else would make someone dictate what others should do, if not for their sense of superiority and implicit bias? Should we grant a free ticket or hand out free cookies to people who have been microaggressive each time their line of defense is, I have an African grandbaby, or I have black friends? What makes it okay to weaponize another human being, a black baby in this instance, just to prove the point that your behavior is not problematic? Africa is not a country. I'll be sharing sections from a short story in progress. It's titled, Now You're Here. I don't dedicate my readings to anyone, but I'll break my own rule here. I dedicate this reading to people who have been cast aside as other, who have been forced to put in the extra effort just to prove that they belong and their existence is valid, and whose power to tell their own stories has been robbed from them. To you, with my cautious hope for a better and safer world. Now you're here. On the day you arrived in Pittsburgh, a cold, cloudy morning in September, a man walked into a synagogue during a Shabbat service and shot 11 Jews. Your mama rang you up to inform you. She cried as she spoke. Stay at the airport, she said. Don't leave. You were hungry, tired. The last thing you ate was a handful of pretzels, which an old white woman seated beside you, barely smiling all through the connecting flights from Paris to Pittsburgh, had shared with you. People were shuffling all around you, microphones blaring with flight announcements. You could not find the baggage claim area, so you perched on the wide metal bench at the arrival lounge and nibbled on your lip you had made a mistake coming to America. A woman screamed. You stared in her direction. She whipped her blonde hair from side to side, yanking at her clothes, tears pulling in her eyes. Oh no, she shouted. People, black and white, children and adults, stopped to gaze at her. A glimpse of pity here, another bewildered glance there. Some whispered. Others shook their heads as though their disapproval could stave off the woman's screams. You figured she had received the news too. You guessed she had lost someone, a child, a brother, a husband, maybe. Only a woman who had lost something precious would make such a sin. Your phone blinked alive. Are you there? Your mother asked. Are you there? The Wi-Fi was weak. Your mother's voice receded, fading, 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 until all you gleaned was static. Some men in green vests sprinted toward the woman. Now she was rolling on the floor, the ends of her skirt bulking at her knees, her chest flat on the ground. You had never imagined a white woman would mourn the same way mothers did back in Nigeria, especially the way your mama wailed when your uncle Chioke told her of how a truck had run over your papa on his way back from work, how the accident had left your papa as a scatter of brain tissues, mangled skin and bloodied innards. You questioned if Uncle Chioke, a man your papa had supported all through his life, was mocking you and your mama, 
why he had to describe every gory detail of your papa's death. The first thing your mama did upon receiving the news was to grab Uncle Chioke by the nape, commanding him to eat the words he had let out. Did he not realize this was a holy Catholic home, built with the sweat of your papa and blessed by the holy oil and holy water of the local bishop? Did he, did he not know it was only the children of the devil who delivered bad news? When Uncle Chioke, out of breath, his eyes popping out of your sockets, did not respond, your mama bawled. You were beside your mama in the parlor, and you speculated your mama's screeches would shatter the glass windows. But the glass windows did not splinter, and you and Uncle Chioke's ears survived her screams that day, and on the day of the funeral. And on a Sunday, two weeks after the funeral, when your papa's kinsmen came to claim your papa's acquisitions. The duplex where you and your mama lived, your papa's 2005 Mercedes-Benz, your mama's silver Honda SUV, wasn't it with your papa's money that she had secured the car? Your papa's kinsmen requested every certificate of property. So your mama yelled and yelled, collapsing to the floor, a wrapper slack about her waist. This time, you did not envision glasses exploding or the earth quaking at her screams. You pictured the Almajiri children who lived under bridges with their mothers, chasing passersby, begging for money, for food, for scraps. You reckoned such a life for you, your siblings, and your mama. But your mama, a barawain, strong woman, top of a 96 class from law school, did the kinsmen miss this? had said she would hire a lawyer, a formidable lawyer, and she would fight your papa's kinsmen tooth and nail. Your papa's testament rescued you, your siblings, and your mama from becoming our Majiris. What would save this white woman here in the airport? The men surrounded her, attempting to contain the scene. You clutched your stomach, uncertain which was worse, your hunger or the woman who had lost someone you rose, your laptop bag slung around your shoulder. You staggered, regained balance, wobbled. The world beneath you was quicksand. Your eyes caught the woman's, and then she ceased screaming, as though by the mere exchange of stares, she had gained redemption. Yet she sobbed. Her air was tousled, and the contents of her handbag splayed around her. You braved a, a step. The prospect of fainting jolted you. You could not bear to unleash a scene. You foresaw strangers campering toward your limp body on the ground and shrugged off the trance. You scanned around, your sights bleached by the white bright lights flooding the hallways. Then you discovered them, the arrows and the labels. They were there to guide you around the airport. How could you have missed them? In five minutes, you are at the baggage claim area, awaiting your suitcase, flanked by other people whose eyes roved from one bag to another on the carousel. Your suitcase emerged and your phone beeped. You brightened the screen. It was Chris, the professor you would be living with during your graduate program. He was eight minutes away and asked if you could please hang around exit terminal two. You obeyed the arrows again, navigating to the exit. You had linked with Chris through a friend, Maria, on Facebook. Maria had added you as a friend two years before when she stumbled upon your blog, Add Facts. She was studying international diplomatic relations in the United States and liked your two cents on the African political scene, especially your views on the political situations in Uganda, Kenya, and Nigeria. She was one of those early commenters who laced her replies with jargon so that they sounded important and impressive. You wrote back, curdling your sentences with vocabulary you had gleaned from voluminous texts on world history and human rights activism. When you pontificated about race, Maria encouraged you to publish the 600 and something word essay in parts in a US magazine. In the first part, the one you titled, Why Africans Should Talk About Race, you traced the works of Martin Luther King Jr. Ella Baker and Rosa Parks to the contemporary struggle, 
You believe the average African found the discourse on race to be irrelevant because Africa, you argued, was fraught with its own socio-political issues like Boko Haram terrorism in Nigeria, xenophobia in South Africa, extrajudicial killings in Kenya, and the persecution of LGBTQIAs in Uganda. You recounted your experience on a commercial bus during your visit to the US Embassy in Victoria Island, Lagos. A man had complained to no one in particular how he considered the President of the United States to be an obtuse racist, how the blacks in America suffered from his overt casual racism, and a woman had countered in a rich Yoruba accent that the last thing the man should care about was America and her racism. Nigeria had enough on its plate. Two years before, you attended a student-organized conference in London centered on leveraging high technology for the betterment of the world. You had nearly missed the conference as your visa was delayed. You pointed readers of your blog to another post you titled, The UK Visa Wahala and the Racist Attitudes Toward African Immigrants. At the conference, you delivered a long speech on the need to introduce machine learning and artificial intelligence in high school curriculums. Afterward, a white man approached you to ask where you had learned to speak English so well. You expressed your shock at this question and concluded with a cliffhanger, persuading, persuading readers to subscribe. In a postscript, you announced you had been awarded a full merit scholarship to pursue graduate studies at the University of Pittsburgh. Now, Chris was two minutes away from the airport. People milled all around you, loading their bags into cars, smiling, laughing. You examined two men embracing. One was gray-haired and a few inches shorter than the other, who was young, mostly, and freckled. Again, you remembered your papa. Before he died, your papa was an employee at Modcom Oil. He was retrenched when a fleet of oil rigs was vandalized in Portacot, and 10 expatriates were kidnapped. It had been on the covers of dailies. It was talked about in the news. Your mama had been on edge. The night before, she burned the yams for dinner and served your papa lumps of cha. When your papa asked if she was out of her mind, she shambled off to her bedroom, sprawled on the floor, and wept. Can't anyone see the signs? She said, her cries settling in the small corridor connecting the bathroom and toilet. The following morning, it rained. The wind, in angry gusts, deroofed your mama's coop. Two of her chickens died of cold. That same morning, your papa was fired. Where are you? Chris texted. You were at the wrong exit terminal. The hunger was toying with your vision. You sidled alongside the revolving doors of exit terminal one and headed north. Two weeks before you arrived in America, Chris had Skyped you. The first time, he wanted to learn more about you and your family. When you mentioned you had nine siblings, he gasped and you laughed. Sometimes you could not make out his words. They seemed to mingle with one another escaping his mouth in an accent that evoked liquid pig milk, white, clean, fluid. Other times, the internet was so poor, each word lagged the next. Chris was a blonde, middle-aged professor at Duquesne University. He was divorced, he told you, and had been with his girlfriend, Susan, for 15 years. You ruminated on how strange it was that he was unmarried at his age how a romantic relationship could stretch for such a long time without a ring to it. You had watched American rom-coms, thrillers, and sci-fi, yet the reality of the American life puzzled you. The next time Chris kiped you, he asked if you had ever lived in a big house. He laughed as he talked. You were unsure how to respond. You assessed how silly the question was. Did you think you dwelled in a hut in Nigeria among goats and pigs with no electricity, eating raw maize for food? Did you envision your country as a place with no roads, its people strutting around naked, dying of diseases, unable to read and write? 
You told him you worked in a bank. You could not get an engineering job after you graduated from the university. No one would hire you because, no, you did not have 10 years of work experience. No, you were not certified in this or that. Your uncles and aunts were no big oga or madame who worked in oil firms. Even if they were, would they have helped you? Chris was surprised you spoke English so well. The following day, Chris drove you to the grocery store, the clothes store, the shoe store, and the colony club where he played music in a band. He asked if you had an awesome time. You nodded and thanked him. You cleared your throat. Did you hear of the shooting that happened yesterday? Chris glanced at you, puzzled. Then he said, oh man, that? A protracted silence tumbled between you and him as he stared. For a moment, you hated yourself for initiating such a topic. You could have asked about his girlfriend, who had spoken to you over the phone, commenting that she loved your accent and couldn't wait to meet you. You could have related how thrilled you were to be in the US. You inspected Chris's face and deduced nothing. Your body tensed. You gnawed your lip. I guess America did not do a great job in welcoming you, Chris said and forced a laugh. What do you mean, you asked. Chris veered on, left onto Braddock Road and crawled to a stop at the red light. Listen, man, America still has its problems, but you never have to worry about your safety in this city, okay? You nodded and said nothing for the rest of the ride home. Later, in your room, you googled shootings in America on your laptop. You read article after article, gawking in horror at your screen. On the same day you arrived in Pittsburgh, five people were wounded by shooters at a high school party. The day before, a 17-year-old was killed in a shooting in New Jersey. Three days before, gunmen maimed five people in a Southside shooting. You clicked page after page of Google results, summing up the death in your head until you lost count. You shut your laptop, shut your eyes, inhaled, exhaled. Thank you so much for being here. Would you folks be willing to stand up so we can give you another full round of applause? Ladies and gentlemen, the 2023 Woo! Summer Fish Great. Thank, and thank all of you for coming and being, and being here and being a part of it. I hope it was inspiring. Uh, next up at 4 o'clock, I think some of you in the audience here signed up for the open mic. So uh, take a break, walk in the sunshine, get a drink of water, and hope to see you at 4. Thanks.